How many of you were here last week? Okay, a few of you. Great. We started a conversation about a thing called consumerism. The culture trains us to go into every nook and cranny of our life with a bag around our neck looking what we can get, what we can put in our bag. That self-fulfillment looks like putting enough stuff in our bags. And that that is an even infiltrated church. And that we go from church to church trying to find stuff. And when we get bored or when we get conflict at a particular church, we go into another one because the worship's better over there or the, the preaching's better over there, whatever. And we just kind of, we're looking to get something and put in our bag. Because self-fulfillment means I've got enough in my bag. And it is a view of human existence, but it's also a view of human meaning that is false and does not bring life. Right? That's, the, that's the synopsis of last week. And I encourage you to go back and access the podcast or the vodcast for last week's content. All right, it, We were laying a foundation of theology and biblical truth that we hope we'll be able to walk from now. Plant our feet firmly on And move forward. We use John chapter 12 verses 24 to 26 where Jesus says this. Very truly I tell you, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, I'm sorry, I'm going to need these. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world, will keep it for eternal life, now and then. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. So I encourage you to go back and have a listen if you weren't here last week. What I hope to do is to step out from Jesus' calling on us to... Perfect the skill of dying. Because I think that's an accurate translation of what Jesus' call actually is. He's calling us to become proficient at dying to ourselves. Taking our own priorities, our own uh, expectations, our own desires, and learning to subjugate those to the needs of others around us. Not in a codependent kind of way, in a generous kind of way. We also realized that niceness won't get it done. That many of us are very nice people, and that niceness doesn't die. Niceness fakes dying. That actually, this is a Holy Spirit thingy. This is something that God does through us. Why? Because Jesus dies. Jesus showed us because he got up on a cross and he showed us what the Christian life looks like. Hanging on this cross. And he wants to live that life through you. If you'll let him. You don't have the juice. You're not nice enough to live this calling. But he does if you will give him the ability to do it. And it just means saying, yes, Jesus, I'm in. When that moment comes... Will I choose me or will I choose serve to serve? I'm in. And then he comes and he gives you the grace you need. This week I want to talk a little bit about the practicalities. I want to begin to flesh this out. And I'm actually going to get you an opportunity at the very end to act upon this. The first thing I think that would be helpful for us is if we had a definition to work from. Okay? Just so that we understand What we mean when we talk about the religion of our day, i.e. consumerism. This is the religion of our day. And you and I are adherents to this religion to one level or another. Because you live in this culture, you watch television, or you surf the net, or you drive down the road and are inundated by billboards, listen to the radio, whatever. You have been discipled in the religion of consumerism. And the religion of consumerism says this. It is a belief. It's a belief. It's a faith system. You have to have faith to believe that this will give you meaning. 
The belief that if I focus on my personal fulfillment and fill myself with the things my desires draw me towards, I can achieve wholeness. Does anyone recognize that? (laughs) You know? That's it. And the temple of this religion is the high street, blue water. But it's more than just materialism. It's more than just materialism. Because it's a way that we even approach our significant relationships to get. I have to fill my bag in this relationship so that I can achieve fulfillment. It's a self-absorption that means I can never commit beyond my desires. And it's in all of us. How did we get here? Consumers are made, not born. You see, this religion has always been there. The Greek word eros, in some sense, reflects a consumer love. Not in every sense. There's a legitimate eros that is good and is godly, it's holy. Sexual love between a man and a woman. There is an erotic nature to that that is legitimate and good. A husband or a wife desire each other. That's great. But eros then begins to, when the other love of agape isn't there, kind of giving structure to it, it begins to get out of control and it consumes the other loves. And it becomes this thing, consumerism. But in our modern society, it really was birthed in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. Let me give you an example. Uh, There's a fellow by the name of James Buchanan Duke. He, brought, he bought two machines that make cigarettes. Okay? These machines made cigarettes at the rate of 240,000 cigarettes a day. Here's the problem. That was more than the country in which he lived smoked. In total. So what do you do if the Industrial Revolution has just kicked up outputs... But there's not enough desire for your product. You advertise. And the advertising movement was born. Um, Here's a quote. They realized consumption was a way of life that had to be taught and learned. By trial and error, manufacturers arrived at methods for reshaping people's economic habits. They insulate money-back guarantees and credit buying. They created brand names and mascots to give their mass-produced goods an appealing personality. And, of course, they advertised. How many of you worry about dandruff? Okay. One of the reasons we worry about dandruff is because Head and Shoulders has built an empire of shampoo upon your concern that there's going to be white flakes on your dark colored top. And you've watched these adverts and you've seen the person in the elevator and the person next to them noticing the horrid white flakes. And you've thought that must never be me. And you've turned to the safety and the harbor of head and shoulders to make sure that there are never white flakes on your dark colored top. Consumers are made, not born. You see, because the meaning of humanity is not consumption. That is a model that is based upon the economics of our day, and a perspective that doesn't see humanity as being created by God with an innate eternal purpose. You see, if all I am is an accident, an evolutionary accident, then my desires are all I am. And I need to be empowered for those desires. But if I've been created intentionally by a loving being that has a purpose for me, then maybe there's a meaning that transcends just my desires. Maybe there's something else. 
And then maybe if that being came and lived in a human body and modeled for us what the perfect example of humanity lived to its utmost looked like, I would understand my sense of meaning. I wonder if there's a story about something like that that I could access. You see, my friend, we are exposed to 3,000, on average, 3,000 sales messages daily. Consumers are made, not born. But Jesus gives us another path. It's a better path. It's a more fruitful path. It's a more meaningful path. It's a slower path. It's a more substantial path. And it is a real path. And Jesus says it in Luke chapter 9. Whoever wishes to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake, they're the one who will save it. And I, 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 I gave you this quote last week. Most people wish to serve God, but in, in an advisory capacity only. We love having God as our advisor. But because we're all also partakers in the religion of consumerism, We only give them so much access. It's like, oh, thank you for your advice. We will take this away now and consider it and get back to you about which of your proposals we've accepted. So, this is what life looks like. And then we go and we consult our consumer heart. Does this work? No. And so we come up with some gobbledygook mediocrity in between that is Jesus slash consumerism. This is deep thoughts with Jim on a Sunday morning, isn't it? I'm watching your faces and you're like, oh man, this escalated way too quickly for me. I I, I would love to give you three points in a poem, but our world needs more than that. Do you realize, do you realize that there is an insidious subversion of your desire to follow Jesus that encounters you 3000 times a day? And if you don't bring an intentionality to the field, it's going to take you down. Okay? And three points in a poem aren't going to help you. Let's look at some scriptures. Jesus, Mark chapter 9. If you've got a Bible, if you've got a smartphone, whatever, flip over. Mark chapter 9. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, this is Jesus, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Here's the consumer item. Reputation. Okay? Reputation and position. That's the consumer item on offer here. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last. There's nothing in life that will encourage you to think that way, except for Jesus. That is so countercultural, it is utterly isolated. That is subverted at every turn in your life. It's even subverted in church, isn't it? That's sometimes the unfortunate quality of a Sunday morning. Only a few people get to use their gifts on a Sunday. It's why it's not the center of CV's life. It's a part of our life together, but it's not the center. Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And then he took a little child and he placed them among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Go to the next one, Mark chapter 10. Actually, let's jump over that one. And let's go to John chapter 13, okay? John chapter 13. That might be a bit small for some of you. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, and that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands... And that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper. Now, here's the thing. 
Jesus, knowing that he, God had put all things in his hands and that his destiny was secure, now begins to model genuine significance to us. He begins to subvert the religious of consumerism, the religion of consumerism, in his disciples' lives. But do you notice that it was couched in him understanding who he really was and where his security really came from, that he was then able to live the calling of his humanity? You get that? That's why John included that bit. So, with that in place, he got up from supper, laid aside his garments, taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So when he had washed their feet and then taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. The fulfillment of humanity is not consumption, but service. I'm modeling humanity at its best here, at its fulfillment. You need to understand that. I'm your teacher and I'm modeling it. Now learn it and know that you're wired this way too. Utterly countercultural. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did. Verse 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than their master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one that sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed. If you know these things, you are blessed If you do them, a lot of us know this, but is it then expressed? A new commandment I give you. Do you understand the profundity of that one? A new commandment I give you. Like Moses had given 10 commandments and he was the central figure in, in the life of Israel. And Jesus here says, a new commandment I give you. Whoa. Listen, listen up. This is big. A new commandment I give you, love one another. And that word is agape. Serve one another lovingly. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, men will know that you are my disciples. That you love one another. That you agape one another. This is how you become recognizable. Why is the church impotent in this moment in history in the West? Why are your friends at work not provoked by your Christian witness? Why do you struggle against the onslaught of negativity and unbelief around you in this culture and aren't taken seriously for your faith, although you're granted the freedom to have your own point of view? Why is this? It's because the church right now, in large part, lives an alloy of consumerism and Christianity. And not the real thing. Not the fulfillment of humanity that Jesus had in mind, modeled, and invited us to follow him into. It is a radical life of laying down your life. It is a cross life that helps them recognize us. Maybe part of the problem is they just don't recognize us. Now, for those of you who are new, I want you to know this is not a guilt trip in church. We don't do guilt. Okay? We want to provoke one another to begin to pursue these things. None of us can do them. He does them through us. But we have to realize, wow, Jesus had a different vision for my life than what I'm currently experiencing. Before we will turn to him and say, can you get a bigger part of me and and start to grow me and work through my life more than you are currently because I'm falling short of the vision you have for me. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me give you a few quick thoughts before I draw things down. Servants, not consumers. That's the thought for the day. Servants, not consumers. We do not realize that this journey 
from consumerism to servanthood or the cross life, as we learned last week, a seed growing in, going into the ground and dying is central and essential. It is the Christian life. Now, I read this. I, I actually, when I taught this a few years ago, I went and studied, like the geek that I am, some botany. And tried to understand the process that goes on in a seed once it's planted so that it then can result in a plant, right? And it was a six-fold process. And the fifth step is something called cell degradation. It's where the, cell di- it's where the seed dies. And, it, and the, fifth, the fifth step in this process says this. If cell degradation is inefficient, the resulting plant is less than optimal. You know what that means? If you don't learn how to die, the fruit of your life is going to be muted and stunted and mediocre. There's a skill set that he's asking you to learn from him. How to crawl up on the cross at work, in your neighborhood, in your life, with your money, with your kids. And learn how to die well so that the plant grows up. Because the purpose of a seed is not a tree. The purpose of a seed is a forest. Okay? But sometimes our seed, because we've not learned how to die well, because we've got this weird alloy of Christianity and consumerism, we end up with a very stunted plant that can't even really do its own job, let alone give birth to other trees. If cell degradation is inefficient, the resulting plant is less than optimal. i got a little story I want to tell you and, and, and as I draw things down. Um, I was, after, my, after the second church plant that I led that failed horribly. There was no other way to say this. It was a complete failure of leadership. I made dumb decision after dumb decision. I, I, I started to uh, work with a church in Marylebone, in, um, in London... Uh, called St. Mary's, Bryanston Square. And, and they, they were providing some church planter training. And so I, I, was, I thank God for that. And I went and I learned and I went every Wednesday up to, up to London from where we were living in Hemel Hempstead. And one time, there was a break in the session. And we were talking about church planting in the session before. And I had shared my story of failure and brokenness and and... There's a whole lot to that. I won't go into it now. But we went into the loo, and there were a couple of other um, fellas that went in, and, 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 and I was standing at the urinal, minding my own business. Right? And one of my fellow classmates had just uh, installed himself in one of the stalls. Okay? And as we walked in, And I'm standing there minding my own business. And I began to hear the jingling of his belt buckle. And the the grappling with the handle on the inside of the stall. And the stall door pulled open. And this fellow, he's a Nigerian guy. And he was a lovely man, church planter from Nigeria. And he was standing there holding his trousers with one hand. Pulling the door open with the other. And leaning his head out. And he said, Jim, Jim, Jim. You must read this book. The Breaking of the Outer Man for the Release of the Spirit by Watchman Nee. You must read this book. And he shut the door and resumed his business. Now, can I give you some advice? If a man interrupts said session to recommend a book to you, read the freaking book. It's important. I read the book. And this is what Watchman Nee basically says in this book. It's a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. It's the worst title in the history of books. But he says this. He says, most of us go, God, use me. God, do your thing. Do this. Touch my city. Touch my family. Touch my workplace. Do it, God. So he goes, okay. And he breaks us. And we go, oh, stop. Stop. What are you doing? I said, touch my city, impact my workplace. He said, that's what I'm doing. Because my impact comes through the cracks that brokenness reveals in you. 
That fails on the consumer scale every time. If cell degradation is inefficient, the resulting plant is less than optimal. You see, the life of God is inside of you and it's looking to get out through your brokenness. But we don't want brokenness. We want to be in charge. We don't realize that servanthood is central and essential. And the second thing I want to say is that we think we are the audience or the recipients rather than the players. You know, this is interesting. Um, Consumerism makes you a perennial recipient. So everything you go into, you're the audience. How is this? How is that? And there's this evaluative thing that goes on. I'm the audience or I'm the recipient. That's the way, that's the posture that consumerism puts in me. And if, if the sermon isn't great or the worship isn't great for an extended period of time, then maybe we just move on somewhere else. Why? Because I'm the audience, I'm the recipient. But what if you were playing a sport and you thought you were the audience, but you were actually the players? Okay, I want you to picture this. The World Cup final. And you are on the England team. Who knows when this World Cup final will happen? Maybe only in our imaginations. Go with me. You are on the pitch. England's in the World Cup final. And you and your team walk out onto the field and proceed to pull out folding chairs and sit down and watch Argentina play football. And you'd look at each other and go, look at that. That was an amazing pass. Wow, look at that. Oh my gosh, it went in our net. From 30 yards. That's incredible. Wow. It's absurd, isn't it? It's as absurd as coming to church and thinking you're the audience. If the players think they're the audience, we lose every time. We can go more serious. What if the soldiers think they're civilians? You see, guys, we think we're the audience or the recipients, but we are the players. You have something to bring that somebody will be changed by. You are an agent of change, encouragement, and love. Why do you think, and here's the thing, guys, it usually doesn't have glory and spotlights attached to it. When Jesus modeled this life of servanthood, of agape, of cross life, how did he model it to his disciples? I read it to you just a few minutes ago. He washed their feet. There was no more mundane job in the society. There was no lower peg. I've been trying this week to think of a role that was similar in our society. I'm struggling I thought maybe rubbish men, maybe that's kind of a a humble role. Uh, But I tend to get bossed around by my rubbish men. (laughs) I end up waiting on my road for about five minutes while they finish things. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the fellow who has to empty the port loos after a festival. Yeah? We don't wash feet, and so it doesn't translate. But what Jesus was saying is, look at the spectrum of dignified honor and look all the way to the bottom and pick that one. That's what he's saying. You don't do that if you're an audience, (laughs) do you? He said, 
wash feet. He said, wash feet. And here's the thing, guys. We don't know how to do this. We don't know how to do this because we have been trained by consumerism. So we have a, a thing here at CV where we talk about serving. And here's the thing. Oftentimes, we tend to talk about it very practically. Hey, we need this. Will you be a part of this team? Hey, we've got kids ministry. We need servants to come and serve on the kids team. And it becomes need-based. But in actual fact, if we're going to talk in a healthy way about this, we're not going to talk from a needs orientation. What we're going to talk about is this sense of calling and fulfillment that Jesus has given us. Jesus described the Christian life at its apex. And what it looks like is washing feet. And we need to learn how to be able to wash feet because we've been trained by the shopping bag instead of the cross. And so as a result, there's a process of development in our life that consistently needs to be topped up. So, you know, very often we'll serve for a while and our serving muscles will begin to get sharpened and we'll get good at that. And then we'll take a break, which is legitimate, maybe for a couple years. But it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to get back on a serving team again so that that you are able to sharpen, once again, that sense of foot washing. Foot washing is a skill. Dying to self is a skill set. I got this from a fellow named Nelson Searcy who uses this with his church. And he just kind of walks them through this as people sign up for serving. He says, ministry is not a status thing. It's serving. Ministry is service. My job is head servant. Okay? If I ever have a sense of different, punch me in the mouth. You all have that permission. I'm the bottom of the pile. Or I'm doing my job wrong. Serving is the act of putting the needs of others before our own needs. The goal of life together is to help us become like Jesus. You cannot become like Jesus unless you learn to be a servant. That's what he said. He said, if I have washed feet, you need to know how to do this too. Serving opens people's hearts to God. As you learn to serve, you are entering in the fulfillment of the calling, the meaning of your life, and you will be more available to God. And therefore, it's a part of worship. If we aren't serving, we aren't truly worshiping and growing in our faith. Mobilizing for ministry is a crucial part of discipleship. Because we have to learn And relearn how to serve. Because the world around us turns us into a consumer at the rate of 3,000 messages a day. And finally this. The role of leaders is to equip people for ministry. Now, if you've been in church for five minutes, you will be wary Of being manipulated by this kind of stuff. Because you know what Jim? You need your rotas filled. Okay first of all. They're not my rotas. If there's no food there on a Sunday morning. I don't know about you. I've got breakfast cereal in my cupboard at home. I'm okay. Okay. This is about. Learning how. To be. Jesus-y. You will not be used. You have been used. I'm sure you have. You've been in church. You've been on a serving team. And you ended up on that serving team for years. And you couldn't get off of it. And you burnt out. You want to know why that happens? That happens because of something that we call the 2080 principle. And it happens in church all the time. They teach me about it in seminary. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Why? Because we're a consumer church. Because this is our discipler. And so 80% of the people sit back like an audience. My goal is nothing less than 100% of us learn how to serve. And you know what? No one will get burned out. People will serve for a couple years. They'll take a year off to re, 
get a different perspective, maybe move into another area of ministry that Jesus may be doing. They start to realize, hey, listen, I'm starting to become an audience. I need to do something about this. They'll step back into a role of service to sharpen their serving skills. Why? Because at the pinnacle of human calling is foot washing. That's why. So, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to sing a song to close after that. This break is for you to do this thing. There are three tables back there. There's CAP, and on the left, there are Sunday morning teams. Sunday morning teams comprise welcomers, hospitality team, setup team, teardown team. Okay? Uh, what else do we have back there, guys? Remind me. We, kids. We have the children's ministry as well. Will someone bolt up and get Yanny? He asked me to send somebody to go get him. You got it, Johnny? Awesome. So we're going to take a break right now. Maybe five, ten minutes. And you're going to go, if you have been provoked, if the Holy Spirit is driving his elbow into your ribs, because there is a growth of serving that probably needs to be sharpened. This needs to begin to feel like joy again, rather than a have to. Then... Go sign up, and I'll bring you back. Go. My friends, servanthood is about Jesus. Denise came up to me as we broke, and she talked about how in Jeff's last days, she was serving him selflessly, and it was her joy because she loved him. And I just thought, Denise, that's perfect. That is exactly the image that Jesus is inviting us towards. That this isn't about donuts, or this isn't about chairs, this isn't about the jobs themselves, this is about the one we love, learning how to receive from him as we follow his example. There's so much to this, we're going to have to take some time in the next few weeks to continue to talk about the depths of this, because... It just doesn't get through our thick skulls, mine included. But I just want to close with this story, and then we're going to sing a song. We were a part of Soul Survivor Watford for a very long time, and right at the core of that culture is the story behind the song, The Heart of Worship. Many of you will be familiar with this story, but the story goes like this. People were turning into consumers in this church. It was, it was popular. It was... It was it was the cool thing. And Mike Pilawachi was agonizing over what he was seeing in this kind of consumeristic vibe that was happening. And so he fired the worship band. And so a few people turned up with acoustic instruments, no sound system, and just played so simple worship that, that it didn't, there was no crescendo to carry anybody into the heavenlies. It was just simple, stripped down worship, no worship band. And he wanted to see if his church could worship without it. And the reality is they couldn't because they had become consumers, but they learned how to. That it was a journey back into the heart of worship from the heart of consumers. And that, that band stayed fired until Mike felt safe enough to say, okay, we can do this again because we understand the why again. And that's what serving is. It's the heart of worship. It's Jesus. It's learning once again. And for some of us, we've lost the heart of worship and we need to serve not because there's a need that needs to be filled, but because there's a heart that needs to be set free by washing feet for a season. Okay, so stand up and we're going to sing that song together.